Let's pray together. Father, as I unite my heart with these Bible study fellowship leaders from around the world, what a privilege. And I thank you for it. And I ask that you would come upon me now as I speak and upon them as they listen so that the transaction would be built on truth, that the name of Jesus would be magnified, that your word would be honored, that we would rely upon the Holy Spirit and not upon ourselves and that your mission through BSF would advance globally for the great glory of your name. This is what we long for, Lord. We exist to spread a passion for your supremacy in all things, for the joy of all people. So come, cause that to happen now, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. When I think of Bible study fellowship and the, the Many people I have known over the last 40 years who have taught in Bible study fellowship, I think of people who live and die by what the Bible teaches. That's what I think of. People who see and write <laughs> on, on their website this, God's truth to be studied, savored, and lived out. That's the Bible. And when I read that, I said, that's my word, savored. <laughs> no, it's not my word. It's God's word, right? Sweeter than honey or Psalm 119, 103. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Savored, that's the right word when you come to the Bible. If your heart is in tune with the worth of scriptures. So I say all of that to let you know that I love what you do. I love what BSF is about. And I count it a huge privilege to have a few minutes to encourage you to press on and to give yourself unstintingly to the glorious calling of teaching other people, not just what the Bible says, but how to see it, right, for themselves. So what I've been asked to do now in this message is to focus on the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis, which is what BSF is or will be studying along with other things. And I'm supposed to draw out of this story truths that will establish you and motivate you in your task of leading people into the discovery of God's word. It's a story of how God himself, and this is what makes it so provocative. It's not just a story of how God rescues a people from famine, it's a story of how God himself brings his own people into life-threatening extinction. He brings them in to life-threatening extinction, all the while planning an unimaginable rescue from his own calamity. That's the story of Joseph. He brings his own promise to the brink of failure. He brings his own promise to the brink of failure only to show he's been in charge all along and he's been planning a God-exalting deliverance. So let's trace the story and see if I can show you these things so that you can see them for yourself and not just take my word for it. The story begins in chapter 37. Joseph is 17 years old. He's a son, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. He's 17 years old. His father loves him better. Not a good idea for dads to play favorite like that. That's what he does. Therefore, his 11 brothers hate him. They hate him. It says because of this, verse four, 
All his brothers hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Then on top of everything, Joseph has a dream that sometime in the distant future, we know now it's 22 years, all those brothers and mom and dad are going to bow down to him. (laughs) That did not endear him to his brothers at all. And it says in verse five, they hated him all the more. So one day... They're out hitting the flock. They see him coming and their hatred and jealousy boils over. They resolve to kill him. They throw him in a pit. Reuben tries to save him. While Reuben is missing, they sell him to the Midianites into slavery in Egypt. Joseph is bought there by Potiphar. And when his success as a faithful follower of Yahweh, when his success is at its peak and his righteousness is at its most faithful, Potiphar's wife slanders him as a rapist. And Potiphar, in fury, throws him unjustly into jail. And again, his success, the blessing of God on him, his righteousness flourishes, his power to interpret dreams is exercised for the baker and the cup bearer of Pharaoh. The cup bearer goes back to Pharaoh, just like Joseph predicted, and he totally forgets Joseph for two more years. Years. Two years he waits. And now 13 years has gone by. He's 30 years old. Every time he thought he was under the blessing of God, doing what God wanted him to do, things got worse not better. Pharaoh has a dream. The cupbearer remembers, there's a man in prison who can interpret dreams. He interpreted mine. Go get him. Joseph says to Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Chapter 41, verse 16. The dream is this. There's going to be seven years of prosperity followed by seven years of famine. Pharaoh is so impressed by Joseph's wisdom that he makes him, what, vice president in charge of making sure that during those seven prosperous years, there's enough grain for the seven lean years. And the writer of this story, Moses, makes very clear three times that this prosperity and this famine are the work of God. Let me read those to you. Genesis 41, 25. God has revealed to Pharaoh, Joseph says, what he is about to do. Verse 28 of chapter 41 God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Verse 32, Joseph to Pharaoh. The doubling of Pharaoh's dream means the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly, shortly bring it about. So God is bringing on Egypt and the entire region, including where Joseph's brothers live, he's bringing a famine, which is going to threaten the existence of God's chosen people. All the while laying a 22 year plan to rescue those people through the very sin of selling Joseph into 
slavery. And so the general point of the story, God brings his people into life-threatening peril, tests them and plans and performs their salvation through the very peril that he brings. That's the story of Joseph. That's the story of the Bible. That's the story of every child of God. When I say that the story of Joseph is the story of your life as a Christian, what I mean is something like this. It comes in answering the question, why do we so often pray, say at the beginning of the day, that such and such won't happen? Breakdown of a car, getting sick with the disease, that some bad thing won't happen. Why do we so often pray that some bad thing won't happen and then in the afternoon it happens? And as it happens, we see that in the very way it is happening, the hand of God, the good hand of God. In other words, it seems to me that pretty normal Christian experience is that God answers prayers inside non-answers. That makes sense? Here's, here's the big non-answer. I, I didn't want this to happen this afternoon. I, I asked you that it would not happen. It happened. And as it happens, I see your hand all over it for good and for grace. How many times have you heard people talk like this? Maybe it's just because I'm a pastor that I've heard it so often. Pray for safety in the morning. Pray that some terrible accident won't happen. Well, the accident happens in the afternoon. And as I hear them telling me this story, they say things like, if, if his head had been a millimeter to the right, he'd be dead. And God didn't let it happen. The woman walking by on the sidewalk was a nurse. The, the ambulance came just like that. It was like three minutes. In the hospital, they had an ample supply of his unusual blood type. Never before would they have such a supply. You hear that, right? What in the world? What in the world is that? Because if I didn't know the story of Joseph, I would be inclined to say, if God's sovereign hand is all over this, why didn't he just prevent it? Why the big non-answer? And then inside the non-answer, all these glorious answers. Why didn't God prevent Joseph from being sold into Egypt? Why didn't he prevent the slander of Potiphar's wife? Why didn't he prevent the cupbearer from forgetting Joseph for two more years? Answer, this is the Bible's answer, because God's way is to bring his people into peril for his wise purposes, all the while planning through the peril, their God-exalting rescue. So about 30 years ago, I had four kids at that time. I have five now. Uh, one of them was nine years old. We were hurrying to make a very special occasion in South Carolina with my father driving between Minneapolis and South Carolina, about 1,100 miles, and uh, on the freeway, on Sunday morning, my car dies with four kids and a wife. It's hot, and it's Sunday. Nothing's open. I look under the hood, <laughs> like every man does, like, what do I know at all about these tangle of wires? Nothing. I'm just looking at it. I've got four kids and I don't know what to do. This is before cell phones. 
And those of you who are old enough know the humiliating feeling that I don't think anybody's going to stop unless I get on my knees or wave a flag or look desperate. They think we're just doing a bathroom break for these four boys. My son, the nine-year-old, says after my pacing back and forth and doing nothing helpful, Daddy, maybe we should pray. My first thought was, I did pray. We prayed as a family this morning that this wouldn't happen. Of course, I didn't say that. I said, you're right. What what am I thinking? He and I, this nine-year-old, he and I go behind the car. We bow our heads and we ask God to put it in somebody's heart to help us. When we lift up our eyes, a pickup truck has stopped in front of us. The driver of the pickup truck, I kid you not, is a mechanic. He looks under the hood and diagnoses that our water pump needs to be replaced. He says he lives down the freeway, has a shop, and would I like to drive with him to town, get a water pump, and he would put it in the car for us right there on the side of the freeway. And as I drive with him, I tell him about what just happened with the prayer and I share the gospel with him. What do you make of that? What do you make of that? I had prayed in the morning that God would protect us from harm and trouble and the car died in the middle of nowhere, as far as I could tell. My interpretation is that this is a parable of the story of Joseph. God did not answer my prayer that we would not have trouble. What what did he do? He humbled a proud father Number one, he showed his prayer answering power to a nine-year-old in an absolutely stunning way. He got the gospel into the mind and heart of a mechanic. And we were on our way in, I don't know, four or five hours with a new water pump without having to go to a store. This is the way God works. He brings his people into trouble while planning for their good. Suppose Satan was involved in our little event. He broke, he broke the water pump, which he can do, I think. Because he meant to make us miserable. And he meant that we would lose faith in the goodness of God and his prayer answering power. If that were true, which it may well have been, what would you say to Satan? If you know the story of Joseph, what would you say? I know what you would say. This is what you want your students to say when you're done with the story. Satan, you meant it for evil. My God, who loves me, meant it for good. That's what you'd say. Which is why I say that sentence, chapter 50, verse 20, is like a banner over the entire history of redemption. And at any given point, where evil strikes God's people, you can say that sentence truly. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. 